Good morning, everyone. I would like to call to order the hybrid virtual Pasco County Board of County Commissioner meeting of April 20th, 2021. At this time, please silence all electronic devices and mute your microphones. Please rise for invocation and pledge. Oh, merciful creator, your hand is open wide to satisfy the needs of every living creature. Make us thankful for your loving providence and grant that we, remembering the account that we must one day give, may be faithful stewards of your good gifts. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Here. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Here. District 4, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Here. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Here. District 1, Chairman Oakley. Here. Uh, reminding everyone that they would do all our voting by roll call since Mr. Moore is not present but virtually here with us. Uh, Mr. Steinsteiner, will you please uh, go over today's proceeding with BCC? Be happy to, Mr. Chairman. On March 12, 2020, the Board of County Commissioners declared a local state of emergency after the governor is issued executive orders 2051, the public health emergency, and 2052, the state of emergency related to COVID-19, which has recently been extended by executive order 2145 on February 28th, 2021. The board has chosen to hold its board meetings with a quorum physically present, utilizing communications media technology for the public and team members to participate. A detailed notice indicating the board's intent to conduct a hybrid virtual meeting was posted on the board's website. On September 25th, 2020, the governor issued Executive Order 2244, moving the state into phase three of the governor's safe, smart, step-by-step -step order, which was extended by Executive Order 2297, issued on November 24th, 2020. Large gatherings of over 50 people is still not recommended, to congregate in any public space that does not readily allow for appropriate social distancing. The state's Surgeon General's public health advisory is still in place with regard to maintaining social distancing and avoiding gatherings of 10 or more people. The public has afford been afforded an opportunity to make public comments either in writing or by use of communications technology that has been provided. The board adopted resolution 2182 on June 30th, 2020, establishing the procedural rules for hybrid virtual meetings, such as the one being held today. As with any meeting you wish to take action, you are required to take public comment on any proposition pursuant to section 286.0114 Florida statutes. I'm available for any questions. Okay, thanks, sir. Now is the time for public comment. Citizens are given an opportunity to comment on any item coming before the board during this section. The board is also takes public comment on items to be placed on future board agenda and other business under their preview. Due to COVID-19 operations to safeguard the well-being and safety of our citizens and staff, today's public comment will be handled as follows. First, we will take public comment on those from those who are pre-registered for a WebEx link and are currently on queue. After, we will read the into the record public comments, documents, PowerPoints, or videos that have been identified by members of the public to be read out loud, played, or played in the meeting, or received in file. Also remember these items, whether you have an item read into the minutes or if you are speaking to this uh, public comment, you're given three minutes only. Finally, we will take public comment from those currently signed up at the kiosk station. Okay. Comments are not to be played, ex not to exceed three minutes per person. This new format does not waive the request that when you address the board, comments are not to be directed personally against a commissioner or a team member but rather directly to the issues. This provides natural respect between the board members and the public. For WebEx and Kiox participants, after 
stating your name and address for the clerk. The timer will be activated and we'll start a countdown. After two minutes, one beep will sound and letting you know that you have one minute remaining. After the timer is, is up, two, two beeps will sound indicating three minutes are up and you should close your comments. WebEx uh, participants will be disconnected when their time is up and Keox participants will be asked to leave the Keox station. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone pre-registered to speak on WebEx? Uh, yes, Chair. We have um, one person pre-registered and another person is on WebEx that w did not pre-register. Mr. Chairman, it's my understanding that Commissioner Mariano's office contacted the administrator's office to have this person who filed late um, attend by WebEx today because of the item he's bringing up in old business. If the board wishes to hear from that uh, constituent, um, I would recommend that you suspend the rules 20 Resolution 2182, the section on, on notice or uh, pre registration for the, that individual to speak to you today. Okay, what's the pleasure of the board? Let, let me ask this did, did, it come in did, did it come to me before noontime on Monday or did it come after that? What I saw from the administrator's office this morning was it came in at 8.55 last night. Um, I mean, I'm not looking to change the rules. If it didn't get in, it didn't get in. Okay. So. Yeah, Thank I, you. I agree, because then we don't no, have I, any rules. Because yeah. I did have a few that got in you could, before you could noon on Monday. I told me it didn't before. Don't so. I, don't, so not, I don't know the specifics of this, so I just saw the email this morning and I hadn't seen was trying to... <laughs> no, I don't, I don't change the rules. All right. All right, so we do have one person who pre-registered, uh, Ms. Kristen Tooley. Ms. Tooley, if you could state your name and address for the record, please. Uh, my name is Kristen Tooley. My address is 17708 Wendy Sioux Avenue, and that's in Hudson, 34667. You may proceed. Thank you. Uh, we're joining here. Um, Jack Mariano, Mr. Mariano, is going to be bringing up something that's uh, very important to our neighborhood. Um, we've been having some really serious issues uh, involving trespassers, um, which has caused property damage um, to my property, as well as it has caused injury to myself and my animals. Uh, and just the amount of traffic that goes through is really disrupting to this neighborhood. Um, we, he will be presenting several things that have uh, pictures, videos, things like that that I've brought up of just how, just how bad this problem really is. Um, just this past weekend, um, there was actually one of the police cars that was hit from an ATV that they were trying to kick out of the, the posted no trespassing area. Um, there's also was an ATV accident. Um, two weeks ago, I had a group out right at my fence line that almost flipped an ATV into my fence, um, almost watched somebody die because they were crowd surf. They were surfing in the back of the truck and the truck spun and almost rolled, ran them over. Um, it's all day, all night. On the weekends, we get no sleep. Um, there's, you'll be uh, hearing a letter from a Rebecca Pritchard who lives over on Coyote as well as a couple other residents over there um, where she has a total of six houses past her on a dead-end road, Coyote Road. And the amount of traffic that goes down that road between ATVs and trucks that ATVs aren't even supposed to be on the roads but there'll be 20, 30, 40, 50 vehicles an hour or more on a dead end dirt road with six houses down there. The music is so, they play their music so loud, they're a distance away from me, but it sounds like you live in a, a nightclub between the ATV engines and the, and the music. I mean, we live in an ATV park slash nightclub. You get no peace and quiet whatsoever, and it's 24 seven. They're, they're always running around out there. I mean, it's, it's really a nightmare. So I was hoping maybe to get something, something on the books, maybe some ordinances changed or uh, added that may be able to help deal with this with getting the property secured. Um, we do have the full backing of the Pasco Sheriff's Office. I have an email from that where they're backing the proposed changes that we're, we're suggesting on 
to get these property owners to actually secure and maintain their properties to try to put a stop to this because I know that our neighborhood's not the only one that's having the issue as well. This issue is a countywide issue. I'm just lucky enough to have got been able to get something before you would actually get get some attention and somebody listening to it to maybe get us some help. Okay, thank you. Thank you. you. Anyone else signed up for? Uh, no one is on WebEx, um, but I do have some emails of requests okay. to be read into the we'll record. start emails at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I would suggest that you take public comment at the kiosk in case somebody mm -hmm. has shown up. Okay. And wants to live test, live do live testimony when they send an email in, just thank you. Oh, just so that we don't have to tell somebody who's live. No, you've already had your three minutes by email. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, is there anyone at the kiosk? There were people at the kiosk when I walked by. Please state your name and address for the clerk. Oh, Alexandra, half the okay. school. Where you all be? I'm sorry, we had some technical difficulties. Uh, technical difficulties. We, we can hear you now. If you, could, if you could please restate your name and address for the record, and then you may begin. Thank you. OK, thank you. My name is Alexandra Pappas Gould, 3948 Silhouette Lane, Holiday, Florida, 34691. Okay. Thank you. You may proceed. Hi, my name is Alexandra. Good morning. I live off of Buena Vista, uh, back on Lake Conley, had the property for 87 years, my family, and uh, the road going, uh, it's an eighth of a mile, the road of Buena Vista, and it has 20, I just counted the potholes, 2,500 potholes, y'all, um, I can't hear, y'all have um, filled the potholes for 25 years that I've been living out there, my whole family lived out there at one time. Uh, it's um, it's the hood. It's uh, got drug dealers. It's got uh, condemned trailers on that street. Uh, one of this that was paved last week. It's beautiful. It's uh, 500 feet from us. Uh, the machinery is still there. Um, I've been asking to have my road paved for a whole year now. And Commissioner Starkey, I've been um, talking with her. Uh, she drove that road. She told me she did. I don't know if she did, but how bad it is. Um, again, we have uh, the homeless. Um, three years ago, I was armed robbed in my house at gunpoint and, and um, taped up and robbed. Uh, my, my husband, my son, and I. And um, again, uh, it's really bad. I'm sure the sheriff's office has told you what's going on there. It seems to be that street. Um, it's out of hand. I need help. I need it to be paved and cleaned up. There's a burnt trailer. There's condemned trailers. There's drug dealings going on. Uh, you just need to come down there and see what's going on. It's really bad because that used to be a very nice place it's where the shuffleboard court is. And it was usually people from up north that had their little summer winter homes here. And it was really nice back in the day. But it's gone to trash. And I have to go through it every day to keep and I was told that, that I don't live on that street, but I do live on that street because that's how I get to my house. And the two homes back where I live on Lake Conley just sold one for one million, one for a half a million. So they're paying big taxes back there too. The potholes that have been um, taken care of for the last 25 years that I've been here, the money that has been spent at least two to three times a month, the potholes are filled. Now, the danger is when you come off of 19 to get onto Buena Vista, if it has rained, there's two feet of water. So you, the people slow down to cross over 19. There's been many of accidents there. Uh, that's how bad, because there's a big dip with big potholes. I've lost four tires in one year. My husband with his diesel truck, too. I drive a truck. My daughter had to get rid of her car because she couldn't make it down the street because it was tearing it up. Um, I'm just asking for something to be done. Um, like Alex? I said, Bonita, 
Yeah. Uh, um, this is Commissioner oh, yeah. Starkey. At the board meeting, at our last board meeting, we started the process for a board. You. She can't hear me? Hello. She can't talk, yeah. I can't hear her. Oh, Wait a minute. Something's wrong. Uh, okay. Okay. I'm going to walk out there and talk. Oh, just okay, go ahead and start. finish your comments. When, when Starkey was talking, we couldn't hear her. They okay. muted the room. So, you, so we can't. Yes, sir. Name, name and address for the clerk. William Burchard, retired scientist, uh, living in Newport, Michigan, Florida, 34252, Olympia Street, near Elford. Okay. Start your comments. You can go ahead and have your comment now. Okay, my comment. Um, I'll start with it. Oh, my papers, I printed a lot of stuff that uh, is what I'm going to ask you about that I wanted to give to you. Can somebody take these into you because it would help uh, so you could read long? Can I submit these uh, papers? There's just uh, one, two, three, four, five, five papers. Jack, move, move to receive uh, and file. For you two. I have a motion to second to receive and file. All those in favor say aye. I can't hear that. Roll call. I don't vote. Roll call vote. District 2, Commissioner Moore. <laughs> hey. Hey. District, didn't hear you. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 1, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed. We will receive the items you have. Someone go pick it up. Yeah. Okay. That's all that's going on. I'll take okay. Great. Okay, let me go. Uh, the concern is I'll try to read it. Uh, will any legal people coming across the border, uh, basically with other diseases and things like that, are they going to be fixed? Um, we have a lot of older people here in Pasco County. To condense the items one through six, uh, I've assisted here as community. This day, I also worry about people coming in. Will any of those people be in Pasco County or put in Pasco County or be bust in Pasco County? So uh, the question is, is, is the commission about this? Do you have any answers about this? And do you understand me? And as we read through, I'll just go to number seven. Uh, my sister's 80 plus, angry, frustrated, won't go out of the house. We have a lot of older people in Pasco County. Uh, what are they going to do when people come in with diseases and things we don't know how to handle? Uh, will there be people from the border? Are they being vetted before they come here? Uh, does the commission have any comment on that? Or what do you think we could do about that? Or what would you guys do about it? They won't answer? No, we can't talk to you, sir. You have to give us your comments. Okay. We're listening you to your comments. Sure. Okay. Okay. So the next thing is, uh, uh, will the police stop the BLM and uh, Antifa from burning our city down? Uh, we have the question about that. Uh, what are we going to do about these people that come in? Will the police protect us? Uh, we need. We feel as a group, a group in our area, that we need more police. Uh, when we have a better police support, and then we also have economic questions about government spending so much money that our society here in Pasco County will we won't have to be taken care of, like the lady said about roads or anything else or, or human health. Um, and are you concerned about HR one? Because if it's passed, we won't have a vote. We will not have a vote in 2022. Okay. I have some more things to sit down there. 
But that's the ball. And people are getting very upset. I'm not saying they're going to go to war or civil action. Uh, I do not propose that at all. But I do say that people need to know what's going on. And you guys are the commissioners. We're hoping you're show and you're doing a good job. Pat, nice to see you again. All right. Thank, Thank you, you for gentlemen. your comments. Yes, Thank sir. You. Thank you. Thank you. Name and address. Hey, guys, Brian Paris. Yep, Brian Paris, 7401 Allison Street, Fort Ritchie, Florida, 34668. Uh, just want to continue to say thanks for staying strong on the mask mandate. Healthy people should not be forced to wear a mask. This is the, to address the people that keep saying we should wear a mask. No, we should not. Healthy people should never wear a mask. Also, you guys are still hiding behind this guy, Dan Biles, and behind, hiding behind these doors. Public should be allowed to come in and address you guys without having to go through. I agree with that. And uh, uh, also, I wanted to thank the Pasco County sheriffs. I, I, I've been noticing you guys all around the city, just tired, worn down. We just want to let you guys know we're the people of the Republic. We love you guys. We thank you for your service. We thank you for what you do for us. We know there's going to come a time when you're going to have to pick the oath over the job. We, we pray you pick the oath. Uh, we pray you never come for our guns because the Second Amendment isn't part of the Constitution of the United States of America. And some people look like they're sleeping up there on the board, but it's okay. Over here, it says this guy over here in the right, whatever he's doing. But anyway, I just want to say thank you guys. Have a blessed day. God bless America. And keep, uh, stay strong for it. Stay strong for it. Thank for your comments. Hi, my name is Kathy Julian. I live at 10232 Worthy Lane Way, Newport Ritchie, Florida. And um, I would like to say thank you, even though you guys, to my knowledge, never voted on the mask mandate. Thanks for ending it. Um, standing behind your administrator. Um, and then the other thing is state of emergency. I'm not sure why we're under a state of emergency. Typically, those are from when we're having a hurricane through or something. I don't see a hurricane in the past 14 months. Um, I know it's used for money, and um, but I don't know why we're keeping it in force for that. The other thing I'd like to say is, you know, it was announced in the newspaper last week that these meetings were going to be open to the public, that we could come into the meetings, and apparently that newspaper report was incorrect. So I wonder where they got that information. But anyway, you guys don't seem too interested in what I have to say, so I'll say goodbye. Bye. All right. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Next individual. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, my name is James Hotailing. I'm at uh, 12924 Kellywood Circle in uh, Hudson. And uh, I had some things I wanted to say, but I mean, everything that's that, that needed to have been said has already been said by other parents in other counties, in other states, and, and in fact, in other countries. You know, we're, we're as Americans, we're not the only ones that are dealing with these uh, uh, tyrannical acts from, from their government. The, the governments of the world are all doing the same thing. One thing I did want to ask you guys, if you are aware that just a couple counties away, there's a, there's, there's a sheriff by the name of Billy Woods, and he's actually sent out a memo. I'll read, I'll read the memo verbatim since I'm not for lots of time. This is no longer a debate, he says, nor is it up for discussion. So as for us, my order will stand as is. When you are on duty, working as, as my employee and representing my office, masks will not be worn. He wrote in the memo. He also ordered that any person who walks in the main and district offices while wearing a mask will be asked to take it off. So I'm wondering what he knows that you guys don't know because we can't even go into the facility. Meanwhile, he doesn't even let people into the facility that are wearing a mask because it is actually against the law. The law is a 8612. You're not even supposed to have meetings wearing a mask, and you guys were all doing that. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll leave you with this. Uh, the reason why by Billy Woods made that uh, decision is because he, he makes this statement. We can debate all day as to why and why not people should be wearing masks and why they shouldn't. The fact is the amount of professionals that get, that give us the reasonings for why we should be wearing masks and why we should be social distancing and why we should be having lockdowns, we can find the same amount of professionals that, that say the exact opposite of that. 
So as our as our elected officials, as public servants, we, we want you guys to do what is best for us, not in not what what not what not what is the best interest of uh, corporations, corporate interests, pharmaceutical uh, uh, companies and whatnot. We we elected you guys. Do do what's right by us. And uh, that's that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next individual. Hi, my name is Janine Dombrowski. I live at 2926 Wainwright Court in Fort Ritchie, 34655. I am here again today not to thank you for removing the mask mandate, but to point out how quickly businesses removed their signs and all their door knobsies. The Pasco residents and businesses, I am sure, thank you. However, we need to discuss what will be done about the mask litter everywhere in our county now. This needs to be made a priority. Next step is to address the so-called state of emergency that we seem to be under. The Pasco residents would like a detailed explanation as to why we are under a state of emergency. We want to know the laws pertaining to a state of emergency, as well as the reason for and the scale used. We would like to have this made public. Last but not least, this needs to be the last time we speak to you through a monitor at both county locations. An evening public comment must return to either one. We expect rapid changes and attention to these details. And I will see you again soon. Have a great day. Thank you. Next individual. Hello. Um, hi, my name is Lisa DeCare. I live at 2245 Balsam Court, Land O'Lakes, Florida, 34639. I, I'm very nervous, so um, I hope I get this right because this is so important to me. I, my family moved into the very first house in Lakes neighborhood on State Road 54 in Land O'Lakes 32 years ago. The last time I saw a cougar, a Florida cougar, or a, um, a bobcat, um, until last summer, when one came through my backyard, another bobcat, because of the overdevelopment and the all of the building that's going on here, I'm very concerned about what we're going to leave for the next generation. My daughter is a second generation Floridian, and I, I this is my first time ever coming out and and doing any of this. I just am very concerned about the traffic. I'm concerned about, we don't even have enough like teachers in the school systems as it is. Yeah. And then we're, we're allowing all these builders to come in and build all these fancy houses. Who, who's affording me? We're not paying the teachers enough to come in and be able to work. And I just don't know where we're gonna come up with all these schools. We're literally on top of each other. And I just, I worry about the reason that I know that we moved here because we didn't want to be in all grody Hillsborough County concrete jungle. We liked the coolness factor of the trees. I just want that to be what we're still about 32 years from today. And I think it's really important that we preserve our animals and our nature because it takes so long for it to be there and concrete just doesn't get torn up. It's there forever. And that makes me sad. Yeah. Oh, I still have one more minute. Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> um, sorry, I'm, I'm, like I said, I am very nervous. There's some developments that are being proposed like off of Aaron Cutoff to make this downtown Connerton and it would be tearing up so much of our natural habitat. I just worry about what we are going to leave to our children and how are we going to get around town? I mean, already as it is, I live two miles from my grocery store and it takes me maybe 10 minutes to get there. That seems silly to me. Where, where are these people coming from when there isn't the businesses here to support it. We're only supporting big corporations and not the small business owner. That seems wrong to me. I want us to be a cool county. 
and I, I, I don't, I don't know what else to say, but you'll be hearing from me again because it just, I will. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Thanks for your comment. There is nobody left here for the FPS. All right. Thank you. We have uh, emails to be read in. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, um, 11 emails were submitted and all have requested to be read. Okay. None of them have spoken? None of them have spoken. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, the first email is from uh, Joe Marina at 13738 Michelle Avenue, Hudson, Florida, 34667. In his request, he asked for an email chain to be read into the record. <coughs> So I'll start with this first email. Commissioners, we are writing to express our concern over the recent updates regarding the enforcement of boat lift covers ordinance without providing the opportunity for Pasco County residents to voice their concerns at a public comment hearing. When we purchased our aluminum frame boat lift cover and had it professionally installed, the contractor explained that the cover did not violate any ordinances since it is not a permanent structure, hurricane rated and is removable. They also explained that the language was drafted, presented to, and was slated to be approved by the Paso County Commissioners to formally allow the covers. Our cover was a significant investment and a great improvement to our home. We have noticed that many Hudson Beach residents have invested in improving their properties by installing aluminum frame boat lifts, covers, as well as renovating homes, replacing docks, painting, and our cleaning up yards, which is a great thing to see. Our neighborhood has been neglected for years, and I strongly feel that banning the sleek aluminum frame boat lift covers is a step in the wrong direction for our area. We need an incentive. We need to incentivize people to move to the Hudson Beach area, which will foster the improvement of our community and increase property values. We are concerned that the investment uh, many Hudson Beach residents made would be a waste to, um, if the covers were banned. The professionally installed aluminum frame boat lift covers do not pose a safety threat or block views. Please take our concerns into consideration and approve the uh, and approve the removal professionally installed hurricane rated aluminum boat lift covers in the Hudson Beach area. Thank you, Joe and Sandy Marina. Um, an email from Commissioner Starkey. I believe your contractor was warned not to install any. He was aware we had this ordinance in the works. Please take a look at Google Earth Front Pasco all the way along the coast and you will see very, very few coastal communities allow them. Uh, Mr. Uh, Marina's response, Catherine, thank you for your response. We are unaware of what the county told our contractor, only what was relayed to us by our contractor, which is explained below. We strongly believe that allowing the covers in Hudson Beach would be a great benefit, even if the covers were not allowed anywhere else in the state. The aluminum frame covers do not block views or cause any safety concerns. They are very well built, look presentable, and protect expensive boats from the elements much better than a standard boat cover. We agree that the permanent wood roof structures scattered throughout Hudson are bulky and may pose a concern if they are not constructed to endure hurricane force winds. However, the aluminum frame covers are engineered to withstand hurricane force winds and are very sleek and look great. Again, thank you for your response. Since a public hearing has not been offered as an option, we are voicing our concerns to the commissioners via email. Thank you for all your time and for taking our op opinion into consideration. Okay, so next email is from Larry Hamilton. Address is 13934 Essel Avenue, Hudson, Florida 34667. Please reconsider your decision on boat covers. I'm a 77-year-old, 100% disabled veteran. I'm unable to put a boat cover on and off due to my disability. We had our boat lift covered when the lift was first installed prior to 2000. At that time, we checked with the county building department and there we were told they didn't have any authority as, to, as it was over the water. That if it were over the land, we would need a permit, but since it was over the water, we didn't need one. We are at the end of the canal and blocking no one's view. We are not Miami or Palm Beach. Why was this put up for, why was this not put up for public discussion? Thank you for your consideration, Larry Hamilton. The next email is from Jean Ware, address 21207, Cali Rose Drive, Lando Lakes, Florida 34637. Uh, 
Okay. At the February 9th, 2021 BCC meeting, the board voted four to one to remove canopies from boat lifts. I feel this was a poor decision on their part. Three commissioners, Oakley, Fitzpatrick, and Moore, didn't even have a dog in this fight. This silly law doesn't even affect their districts. Mr. Mariano's district number five runs almost the entire coast of Pasco County. It stops at the very bottom of the coast where Mrs. Starkey's property is located. This is a very small piece of the overall coast. What you have done is let a small section of the coast impose Ms. Starkey's wishes to remove canopies upon the entire coast. Ms. Starkey's neighborhood already has deed restrictions pertaining to roofs and docks. She should get her own HOA to enforce their restrictions. Is she using the powers of the office and the hammer of the county to do this instead? This is just wrong. I feel three commissioners voted along the, with her because it was the easiest thing to do. Now she owes them a vote later down the road. <laughs> I would like the commissioners to readdress ordinance 1001.4 and put in language allowing canopies on boat lifts in Pasco County. This would not override areas where deed restrictions may already have allowed them. I feel we should have the ability to protect our property. This request is not unreasonable and would like the county commissioners to reconsider this option. In closing, I would like to remind the commissioners that I sent them an email earlier this year. In that email, I told you that I had called Central Permitting Office after Canopy Company called me and said that they could not get a permit in Pasco and therefore would not do, uh, and therefore would not do the job. They did not want to risk losing their license. I had seen canopies in the nearby canals so I thought it was odd that they couldn't get a permit. I called the permitting office and they told me I was allowed to put the canopy on my boat lift and did not need a permit. I called the canopy company back and told them to verify. Next day, canopy company called me and said no problem and we now have two beautiful canopies at our place in Hudson. This occurred in November 2018. If you order me to remove them, you are going to send me back, you send me a check for $8,000. Maybe a judge would have to decide that. The next email is from John and Bev Baird. Address is 13521 Garrish Drive, Hudson, Florida, 34667. My wife Beverly and I lived in Hudson for 22 years. In September 20, in September 20 years at 13521 Garrish Drive in Sea Ranch, but always on the water. I do not have a cover on my boat list, but I wish I did, as it would be nice to protect the 40000 I have invested in my boat. These lifts are, that are removable canvases are not the eyesore like you think. In fact, we hardly notice them other than it looks like a great way to protect your investment. I have heard that many, I have heard they may be a hindrance to navigation. This is this I would doubt as we don't use sextants to cruise canals or golf. Please take it from a 22 year resident couple. Mm. They are not a problem with me or anyone who lives out here. I doubt that we have a county commissioner living in Sea Ranch to complain. If so, close your eyes. Please allow us your freedoms, our freedoms to, I'm sorry. Please allow us our freedoms as most active political figures are trying to control us or restrict us. We are people, not sh de sheeple. Okay, we are people, not sheeple. Let us live and enjoy the time we have on this earth. Thanks, John and Beverly Baird. Next email is from Robert Watson, address 15627, Almond Drive, Hudson, Florida, 34667. Dear Pasco County Commissioners, my name is Robert Watson. I'm a property owner and resident at the waterfront section of the Sea Pines community in Pasco County. I'm in favor of allowing the boat lift covers and have been a point that has been a point of discussion in recent commission meetings. I have owned my property in Sea Pines for over 10 years and know personally that the boat lift covers of all types have been in existence there since prior to my purchase in 2011 as many added and many added since then. I've yet to meet anyone in our neighborhood that objects to the boat lift covers. These canals, waterfront communities in Paso County attract boat owners as the primary residence. Boats are part of the coastal way of life and are assets that need to be protected from the elements. I also become aware, I've also become aware that many of the same type covers exist in the freshwater lakes of Paso County and are not being a targeted, not being a targeted as point of discussion for removal. I would ask the question why? 
My business travels take me to the southwest Florida areas of Lee and Charlotte counties, and I've noticed these same boat lift covers are extremely popular to their upscale waterfront communities, and literally thousands of them exist. These engineered and prefabricated style boat lift covers are well constructed and are typically color coordinated with the home. On the other hand, I've seen boats in waterfront communities covered with blue tarps for protection, which is surely an eyesore. I would like to ask the Paso County Commission and staff to review these counties' ordinance regarding these boat lift covers before rushing to judgment for removal. Respectfully submitted. The next email is from Julia Julian Roger Sanders at 3618 Stacy Drive, Hudson, Florida, 34667. Boat lift covers should be on separate ordinance than the dock because boat lift covers do not block view. If it did, you would need to be 10 feet tall. This is a boat community and we have worked very hard to have what we have and we want to protect our boats as you do your car. Next email is from Bonnie Kirkness at 3618 Stacy Drive, Hudson, Florida, 34667. Boat lift covers should be on a separate ordinance. Hold on, let's fix the same thing. Two different people, same thing. Okay, boat lift covers should be on a separate ordinance than the dock because boat lift covers do not block view. If it did, you would need to be 10 feet tall. This is a boat community and we have worked very hard to have what we have and we want to protect our boats as you do your car. <clears throat> Next email is from Jeff Brown at 6426 Beach Boulevard, Hudson, Florida, 34667. I would just like to express my concern over the rumblings I have been hearing concerning boat covers in Pasco County. I am in support of the vinyl temporary covers and do not feel that the statements made in the media by commissioners are a truthful representation of the population of Pasco County. Trying to restrict the use of a quality vinyl cover is just like saying, I can't place a vinyl cover over my parked car in my driveway. I urge you to please stop wasting our tax dollars on a restriction that none of us want to see come to fruition. Thank you for your time and consideration. Next email is from Bruce Marquis, address 6824 Puffin Lane, Hudson, Florida, 34667. I'm writing this email to support my, I'm uh, sorry, I'm writing this email in support of my fellow citizens being allowed to have a boat lift cover if they want one. I feel that the waterfront citizen should be able to vote on this matter. It's too easy for the folks to make a blanket statement such as the vast majority don't want them or all my neighbors don't want them with no evidence. If it voted down by the waterfront citizens, then that's how the majority voted. Or if an HOA or deed restricted community wants to vote for no covers, then let them have it their way in their community. But I don't believe it's the county's place to put this restriction on some of its citizens. They pay taxes just like everybody else. They should be able to enjoy their property as they see fit. If residents have control over one third of the canal, enough to install a uh, lift and store a boat there, then they should be also be able to install a cover on their lift just as well as anyone would construct a gazebo or tiki bar 10 feet away on land. Especially since boat lift covers are much higher and out of line of sight as compared to gazebos. Since the commissioners told us to look at the rest of the state for evidence, I did, and found that most places around the state have covers. On the issue of storm safety, please look at the links from Mexico Beach, Florida, where Hurricane Michael devastated everything around the boat dock, the boat dock covers, yet the covers survived. And then there's a link. Um, street view of the same devastation, another link. Thank you. P.S. Here is a list of links showing boat lift covers in the vast majority of the state. Note, I've only indicated a link here and there. There are typically tons of covers near each link. Hillsborough County, he placed a link. Tampa Bay, a link. Town and Country, a link. Oldsmar, there's a link. Safety Harbor, another link. Uh, St. Pete Beach, Paso Grill, a link. Um, St. Pete, uh, Pete, Florida, more links, Pasadena, link, Bay Pines, link, um, Madura Beach. This is a for rent covered slip business where folks are allowed to work on their bones, boats. Provided a link, Seminole, Florida, 
provided two links. Uh, Google Street View of same roof as you see it, you see that it is indeed a roof and provided two links. Google Street View of same roof as you can see that it is indeed a roof provided a link. Indian Rocks Beach, Florida provided two links. Largo Beach, Florida, one, two, three, four, four links. Brevard County, two links. Tons and tons of them on canals. Cocoa Beach provided a link. New Smyrna Beach provided another link. Florida City, Florida provided a link. Uh, Ormond Beach, Florida provided a link. Flagler Beach dock cover tight canal provided a link. Flagler Beach boat lift cover provided a link. Boynton Beach, Florida provided a link. Hobo Sound, Florida provided a link. Stewart, Florida provided two links. Roseland, Florida provided a link. I'm at my three minutes. There's more links. Okay. Oh, no, I've got two more. Two more. Two more. Um, I have an email from John and Joanne Rocks. No address provided. As homeowners in the Sea Ranch section of Pasco County since 2011, we would like to express our opinion on the boat lift covers. We do not feel the covers blocked any view past the cover. Most of the view past the cover, if blocked, is from the boats on the lifts from which the county charged extensive boat permit fees, which we feel is the whole reason behind the denial of the covers. You are looking for another, uh, about another 164 permit allowing the covers. There are many other blockages along the canals, many that were erected after paying for a permit to the county, then boat lift covers interfering with any view. All right, last email is from Larry Hamilton. Address is 13917 Somers Avenue, Hudson, Didn't you do already do Larry? I think you already did Larry Hamilton. Yeah. Oh, okay. There was, there was a Larry Hamilton early in the... You there was a Jamie ha Hawkenling and number I, two. Number two, I thought was William Burchard. That's what it was written. I have number two, Larry Hamilton after Joe Marina. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant at the kiosk. No. No, you already, um, what I'm saying is, I see. Not, it's down, saying it's, you already read an email from Larry Hamilton. Thank you. It's on there twice. Okay. All right. So that's all. This one, let me look. So Nancy Hamilton on the second one forwarded an email from Larry Hamilton, and the email that is the last one um, is from Larry Hamilton. But um, um, Nancy Hamilton forwarded it from Larry Hamilton asking for it to be read at Larry Hamilton for the one that's identified as number two. Is this like an email? No. Larry Hamilton's email on the second one is different than the Larry Hamilton's email on the last one. And the one from the wife, one from uh, him? Right. Uh, there's no address. Oh, well, there isn't. Hold on. Let me just check to see the addresses are the same. No, their addresses are different. Okay. Let's go ahead and read that last one and we'll be done with it. Okay. And that way we'll not make a mistake by not allowing someone's word being read publicly. Okay. Okay. So this is Larry Hamilton at 13917 Summers Avenue in Hudson. To give you the benefit of the doubt, I'm going to say what's the problem for years of lack of funding and support for your growing water infrastructure deterioration. Florida prides itself on tourism and attracting families to relocate based on a unique waterfront opportunity and lifestyle. Why it is, why it is local, state, federal responsibilities to maintain this infrastructure has failed tens of thousands or more homeowners or tourists to maintain a reasonable waterway. There is also a widespread lackluster of interest, support, or commitment to sincere engage, sincerely engage in the to sincerely engage the public in these coastal areas. Statewide, you have collections of resident of resident citizens that rely on not really implement improvements, but rather restoration of long-term deterioration of the waterway infrastructure. These interested citizens have a large capital investment in the community waterways and annually support funding directly to waterway use. Please address these concerns among yourself in partnership with state and federal officials to become a shining standard 
for funding and a timely action to support all Floridians instead of continuing investing all monies in non-waterway ideals. That is it for the email. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, so that uh, now concludes public comment portion of the meeting. We're now going to resolution. <coughs> RS one or thirty one. Yes, sir. Okay. So we are um, in resolution one, um, recognizing community development department and receiving the Audrey Nelson Community Development Achievement Award. So those involved, please step forward. Wonderful. <laughs> oh, she's ready to go. <laughs> she's going to come see us. <laughs> All right. Welcome. <laughs> Here we go. Resolution number 21-149, a resolution by the Board of County Commissioners of Pasco County, Florida, recognizing the Community Development Department for receiving the 2021 Audrey Nelson Community Development Achievement Award. Whereas in January 2021, the National Community Development Association awarded the Pasco County Community Development Department with the 2021 Audrey Nelson Community Development Achievement Award for their collaboration on the Vincent House project. And whereas Vincent House identified and was funded to address and was founded to address the need for increased mental health services in Pasco County. And whereas the Board of County Commissioners in support of increased mental health services for the citizens of Pasco County donated 10 acres of land in Hudson, Florida to Vincent House. And whereas a grant of over $1 million utilizing community development block grant funding was used to construct a 10,000 square foot facility for the first international clubhouse model program in Florida. And whereas Vincent House's facility and programs exhibit innovation, sustainability, and collaboration for the residents of Pasco County experiencing serious and persistent mental illness. And whereas the Board of County Commissioners recognize the contribution and partnership of the Whistlecoochee River Electric Corporation. Uh, cooperation, yeah. cooperative, sorry, <laughs> with Lucci River Electric Cooperative in the implementation of this award-winning community project to benefit low and moderate income persons living with serious and persistent mental illness to regain the skills needed to become productive members of our community. And whereas Pasco County Community Development Department has demonstrated a commitment to improve the lives of Pasco's low and moderate income persons through community partnerships to fulfill its mission. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of County Commissioners of Pasco County, Florida, that, that the Board hereby recognizes the Community Development Department for receiving the 2021 <coughs> Audrey Nelson Community Development Achievement Award, done and resolved with the Quorum President and voting this 20th day of April 2021. Move approval. Second. Got a motion and a second. All those in favor by roll call vote. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 1, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Job well done. So, um, yeah, Mariano, come and speak. Tell us what, what this is. Yes, sir. Yeah, what? what this award is. I, if, if I could, um, Marcy, before you go, I'd like to thank you, Marcy, for, and your great team uh, with Lacucci, Dave Lambert, and company. Uh, what a phenomenal job. People from the Vincent House. The outstanding work you've done in the past and what you're going to do here in this facility is going to be amazing. Um, David, it was about three years ago we sat down in uh, UI and Amber over in uh, Engle Park looking at that piece of land saying this could work. Yes, sir. Um, yes. And I tell you, so, so impressive, so happy that uh, you guys were able to bring this to fruition. I uh, do want to let you know, too, there's a development coming across the street that they're going to reserve some commercial stuff. And I says, I want you to get in touch with the Vincent House people, find out what type of commercial might work there to help those people get employed where they can just walk right across the street. Perfect. So we're going to continue to partner with you, work with you, and just thank you all for the great work you've done to bring this forward. Thank you so much, Commissioner, and thank you all for this recognition. Uh, we have an opportunity to celebrate some of the good work that is done in our community through the National Community Development Association. So this is a national award, uh, and we did assist with community development block grant funds
to build the building and you all donated the land. And so it was a great public-private partnership with, with La Cucci's uh, electric, electric Cooperative. See, we're both doing the same thing. <laughs> so um, what I do uh, want to take a moment to recognize is the staff from community development that were front lines in making sure that uh, the building went vertical, that uh, all the gopher tortoises were safely removed, all, the, all those things that happen. Uh, behind the scenes, so that is uh, Denise Lindsay, our community development specialist, and Michael Ball, our housing rehab specialist, and they were really on the front lines to assist, and I'm just very grateful for the work that they do. Uh, we had an opportunity last week, David and I, to do a presentation, a WebEx, and uh, talked about the project uh, during community development week, and I think what was most exciting was that uh, there were residents, um, not residents, but um, guests, members, let me get the word right, members of Vincent House uh, that were on it. And I'll tell you that it is just an honor, honor and a privilege to be a part of their journey of healing and restoration in the community. And that's what this is all about, and we all get to share in that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David's going to speak. Commissioner. Thank you so much. And, you know, Marcy talked about the people at Community Development. I just want to say on behalf of with Lacucci Electric, you know, we've had a great partnership of working with you all every step of the way from uh, the administrator, Assistant County Administrator, Community Development. And we got a lot more projects that uh, we're looking to work on. And Lacucci has been one of them, and we're still marching through that after nine years of still being involved and, <laughs> and moving forward. And I think a great transition has come. But what you've done with Vincent House is going to change the lives of thousands of people in Pasco County for years and years to come. So we're very grateful for that. And, you know, I know a couple of you all came and talked about veterans advocacy and homelessness. Um, we are fixing ready to embark on a new 77 unit veterans family housing complex right off of Massachusetts mm -hmm. Avenue with the Pasco County Housing Authority, which will be great for this area, too. And, you know, it's just a collaborative partnership of all of us working together. And I just want to say community development, by hands down, has been such a phenomenal partner for us. It has been in, in working to achieve things together in our community and pe people there. So thank you for everything you do. We greatly, we really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've got these resolutions. Mike Moore, Commissioner Moore, still going to sign these back. Oh, we'll get those all. Okay, with that, we'll move on to um, the consent agenda. I have a full sheet. It has on it uh, C8 to withdraw, C13 to withdraw from consent, but actually being put on public hearing this afternoon uh, at 1.30. And then we have uh, C15 withdraw, and C36 withdraw. Okay, anything else? Move approval of the consent agenda. Second. I got a motion, motion and second to accept the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. aye. Call vote. Roll call. Roll call vote. District two, Commissioner Moore. Uh, aye. District three, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District four, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 1, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed unanimously. Okay, and the items I called out earlier were these are we're going to call for a vote because they're all withdrawn, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, except for item C13, which would be placed on public hearing this afternoon at 1 30. Okay. We will go to. Items. 
Should we go to R39? It's a regular agenda item 39. There you e go. Economic development. Yes. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Mike Bishop. I'm the uh, director of stakeholder engagement at PASCO EDC. I'm here to give the uh, PASCO EDC quarter two update. So, um, <clears throat> just to give a little start off to it, quarter two did start to become a little more normal for us. And you'll see as we go through the presentation, a little uptick in some of the normal services we're used to. So um, that's all very encouraging and I'll kind of go into some more detail here. So I'll start off with our um, overview of our business recruitment pipeline. You'll see we have 42 active projects being worked on, predominantly in the advanced manufacturing industry, one of our target industries. And that continues to be a good source of leads for us. We um, did add a new win in life sciences sector, as you all know with the Moffitt announcement. So um, that is our third success there on the list. And we're hopeful to see a little more, um, a little more leads come in on life sciences because of that. Can you, so, can you hang on one second? Yeah. Is there some reason? I mean, I can't read I can that really. I'd, I'd, I'd like to see the numbers and um, we can't, our screens are blank. Right? Oh. We don't have a handout or presentation. No problem. I'll give it a minute. It's everybody. New Year, guys. There it is. Up. Oh, there it went. Yeah, you probably want to see numbers, and I'm going through it. They, they should restart. Okay. It was there for a second. Okay. There we go. Thank there we go. you. Okay. We're good. Good to go. All right. Um, did you want me to go over that one again, Mr. Starkey? Is, was this your first one? Yeah. Because the you the I heard manufacturing course, so I wanted to see. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, this is our business recruitment pipeline. So you'll see a breakdown on our leads and active projects. So 42 active projects right now. Advanced manufacturing been, being the lead source in active projects being worked. So uh, very encouraging on that part. So uh, diving into a little bit more on the um, <clears throat> current wins. Next slide. Sorry. <laughs> oh, wait. Can, I'm sorry. Can you go back? Yes. Just trying to distinguish between the gray and the orange. So 18 leads. Is that a, that's a lead? That is a lead, yes. So is that separate than the 20 active? So you have 20 correct. active plus the 18 leads? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just wanted to check. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So on the next slide, these are three um, current project wins right now in the breakdown. So um, we have three of the 13 there. You'll see on capital investment and new jobs, we're, we're really hitting the mark on that, um, thanks mostly to the Moffitt announcements. So continue to move on that part. On the next slide, you'll see some of the, um, what I was hinting at on getting back to normal. So we have a good uptick in company visits as, um, you know, COVID is starting to subside and we're able to get more into businesses and offer the services we're used to. So we um, hope to continue to uh, see that trend as, uh, as things get a little bit better. Next slide is uh, some of our events. So this is also on the uptick. We have plenty of events coming down the pike as well. So these are attended conferences, events, You'll notice on there, um, that list also includes our economic forecast luncheon, which we held back in February, and um, had a great presentation from Nicholas Lacey, who's the chief portfolio strategist at Raymond James, and uh, that's on our YouTube as well. So if you missed out, you know, feel free to check it out. It was a great presentation. Little uh, highlights on our social media, um, well, earned media rather, on the first one. So you'll see that we had uh, over 800,000 in earned media and this was mostly driven by project announcements and press releases put out. On the uh, next slide is uh, website analytics. So that's very encouraging. We see that 76% of the visitors on the website are new. So these could be new projects, new site selectors, always very, very encouraging to have a high percentage of new uh, visitors. Uh, quick touch on social media, little uptick on fans, um, total posts and, and videos there. Um, not as usual, but uh, we've been busy nevertheless. And 
and a um, little overview on the um, investorship. So um, we're on the right mark for private capital, um, private uh, investment uh, raise. We have uh, 83 total investors, <coughs> excuse me, 34 of which are uh, board policy council members. And we had two new investors over the past quarter, uh, Stearns, Weaver, Miller, Weisler, Alhadef, and uh, Northbridge Commercial Real Estate Group. So going a little bit into the uh, leadership update, so uh, I had mentioned the, um, the economic forecast luncheon. That's really our first major event that we, we put on on a hybrid basis. Um, we also have a major event coming up, our team up, which is very exciting. This is our joint event with Florida Sports Coast. That's gonna be held at Advent Health Center Ice on May 6th. In, con in conjunction with that event, I do also wanna mention that we were working on a joint video for um, uh, to release at the event, but also to be used for business recruitment and for Florida Sports Coast to use for promoting a good live, work, play environment. So a great collaboration video that we're working on there. And um, also just hinting on the legislative update working through those pieces. But these are some of our upcoming events. As you'll see, we have plenty coming down the pike. Um, really capped off with that team up event. That's gonna be the real, real big one on May 6th. So as always, any questions on that, call my boss. Not me. <laughs> so I'm sure he's watching. All right. <clears throat> any seriously though, any questions on that piece before I move on to the penny presentation? Okay. So <clears throat> on our penny for Pasco, I just want to highlight a couple of the, the key pieces here. So on the ready sites, we have our seventh site um, evaluated and that's complete. International program, the Global Competitiveness Committee is working on the May 27th event the uh, Tampa Bay Regional Trade Update, saying here today, trade tomorrow. Um, I came up with that tagline. And um, we're also working on new um, <coughs> uh, virtual trade missions and starting to get some of those exporting pieces back online. Enhanced marketing, working on that joint video, as I mentioned with Florida Sports Coast, that's in its first edit right now. So really getting excited to see that final come out of the event. Workforce Connect, so still continuing to work with our employers as workforce has, has been a challenge and trying to uh, get them to um, work on developing how to hire the best uh, employers and getting experienced skill, skill workforce. CEO program, the, uh, the biggest piece there is uh, working on getting the CEO roundtable uh, back up and running, so that's coming down uh, later this, uh, this fiscal year. And then Smart Start, I wanted to hit on that a little bit, if you can switch to that next slide. So we had the uh, ribbon cutting for our third incubator center at the Grove, and that was back in February. So I put a, I put a few pictures in there of the space. It's a phenomenally new space. It's great layout, um, good open seating. You'll see there in the bottom left, as well as uh, private offices for budding entrepreneurs to start their business. So really, really exciting stuff there. So I'll skim through this piece. Uh, ready sites I'd already hit on. The highlight there is seven active programs now, or seven active sites rather, in the program. Um, a little map of the sites that we see there. Then going into the individual programs, so Ready Sites program, we have the, the highlight there, just some of the marketing pieces that have been put together, so trying, starting to ramp up some of that marketing. And um, I have a bar percentage there, so we're about halfway through our deliverables on that piece. On international program, this is starting to come around, as I mentioned, so we'll see that we're starting to um, do more assistance as far as export counseling. Um, working on those trade missions. If you can switch to the next one. And then the highlight there is actually getting more export counseling to the Pasco company. So we had a pretty good uptick in that this past quarter. And you'll see that we're pretty close to halfway through on those deliverables here. The uh, CEO program, this is really focused around events. So this is coming up very soon. You'll see on there that we have the, um, the uh, we have a May 7th dinner at the Hyatt. Um, that's a dinner with a shark in conjunction of our Grow Pasco event. So both of those events are our CEO forum as well as our, um, our peer networking event. And on the Workforce Connect program, you'll see a lot of these deliverables are in progress. Um, and we have a program progress report there at about 56%. Diving a little bit into the Smart Start piece, a lot of these are fueled by um, some of the residual of the Paso Emergency Business Grant that we did last year that uh, really required uh, participants, applicants to uh, participate in some um, uh, refocus sessions that were put on. So we're seeing a lot of good engagement that way. So that's what drives a lot of these numbers. 
um, with workshops and attendees. And then our incubator members with the third incubator coming online, these numbers are continuing to grow. So very positive trend in that, in that manner. And uh, you'll see the total jobs created is continuing to go up. On the uh, co-starters program, so um, I believe there was one um, trainee in that piece, and then we also have one co-starters graduate. That's, um, they're, being, they're going to be graduating another class next week, so we'll see those numbers increase. And these are some of our, um, our pen partner numbers as far as workshops um, and uh, individual counseling sessions that are happening. And some of those deliverables are continuing to be in process throughout the year. Microloans, um, we are actively marketing that piece right now. Um, that's, that's something that we will see ramping up here over the last uh, half of the fiscal year. And then on the last piece, I have all the programs, uh, bar charts, the progress, and uh, you'll see we're pretty close to about 50% through on deliverables and uh, working our way through the rest of the fiscal year. So um, any questions? None on this. Question? Uh, I'll ask a question. Um, okay. I have a question on the, um, the Smart Start or the incubator thing mm -hmm. in Land Lakes. Where, where is that? It's at the Grove in Wesley Chapel. The, oh, uh, and, and Mark Olds? Yes. D um, so, right. Oh, that's right. I, I remember talking about that. Okay. Yeah, did he donate that space? Um, no, we're leasing that space. And Okay. And who did the build-out for it? Um, I believe Mark oversaw that. That's a better question for Dan, the program manager. Okay. Um, but uh, Dan was, or sorry, Mark was instrumental in helping the efforts with getting that built out. Right. That so, looks yeah. good. And that table looks very cool in there. Yeah, very cool table. Yeah. 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 I almost had to move it, but fortunately, someone else showed up. <laughs> Roger, yeah. Yes, very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have a great okay, rest of your thanks. day. Right. Appreciate it. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. I never yeah. comment in the presentation, but I just wanted to reach out and say thanks. To, I'm, sure, I'm sure Bill's watching right now. So, I'm sure. Uh, you know, driving down I-75 yesterday, watching all the progress on the Old Pass Business Park as well as the, the ramp. Um, you know, Bill's leadership and listening to what was a conversation with the commission to help push that forward to make that an employment center has been phenomenal. Um, and I'd also like to thank him for looking into and making a comment on which I thought was unique on the uh, Central Pasco Employment Village. Uh, he had some good input. I want him to stay focused, and I'll be looking for his, as, this, as that project comes forward to, to what his input is, what we can do best out there, especially was the school wants to put a vocational school out there. So this could be something really good to, uh, to jump on with. So appreciate all your help. You guys are doing a phenomenal job. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, we, what time is it? 11.16. Okay, now it's time for a uh, time certain, which is R40. Oh, they're online? Yes, sir. This is a presentation from uh, Feeding Tampa Bay, their CEO, Thomas Mant. Okay. And Thomas, I think you're online. You're good to go. Yes, I uh, think everybody can see me, and I do see our presentation up. So thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity to present uh, to you today. We wanted to make sure we gave you an update on what we're doing up in Pasco County and how food relief uh, and the work that we do is impacting the folks that you all are elected to uh, serve. Uh, and that we're certainly pleased to be able to serve along with you. Uh, so um, I'm not sure who's driving our slides for us today, but we certainly appreciate you doing that. Uh, and we'll run through a little presentation here. And if you all have some questions, we certainly would be happy at the opportunity to uh, answer those. Um, so next slide, please. If you all don't know this, Feeding Tampa Bay is a part of Feeding America, which is a national food bank model. And this is critical to Pasco County because if you don't know, there's not enough food in Pasco County to feed everyone in Pasco County. So we bring food resources from outside of the county uh, via the state and nationally. And we work along a model that's tried and true and tested. Uh, we've been here close to 40 years and food banks in general have been around for over 50 years. And so we apply the skills, tools, resources uh, from that model and, and uh, use that locally uh, in Pasco County. Uh, next slide, please. 
Just a little bit more about us, if you don't know, Feeding Tampa Bay is the largest food relief organization in this 10 county area. You can see the areas we serve. I think it's always important for counties to understand that while we look at borders and boundaries and the way in which we govern and serve, the reality of the clients that we serve, they don't observe borders in the same way. So someone in Pasco County that lives there could be getting food in Hillsborough County or in Nellis County. And so we think it's important that you understand it's an integrated process that we're able to build for you. As it notes there, we're nourishing right now more than a million folks who are food insecure. We support about 450 or 500 agencies. And then I think importantly for you all, uh, because of the pandemic, we'll actually provide close to 90 million meals in the course of the, this pandemic year. And I'll talk a bit more about um, uh, Pasco County in a moment. Next slide, please. I think importantly, as we look at the impact of the pandemic, uh, pre-pandemic, we had about one in seven folks were food insecure. Now it's one in six. And if you don't know, one in four kids are food insecure in Pasco County today. And then a statistic which really just amazed us was in our work during the pandemic, we found that in doing some surveys, some 68% of the folks who were coming to receive food had never been in a food line before. And I think all of, all of us know someone who's been impacted by food insecurity. We know neighbors, friends, family members, uh, people that were impacted. Those folks ended up in our and our partners uh, care uh, uh, as, uh, as we uh, went our, made our way through the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So we want the commission to know our goal is a hunger-free Tampa Bay by 2025. And what that means pretty simply is everyone that has want or need of a meal, we're able to provide it. Or just as importantly, we're able to get folks out of a food line by providing resources, training, partnerships, programs that create personal or household stability. It's a big and audacious goal. Uh, but it's been done across other counties and regions in the United States, and we've actually spent time studying those to make sure that it's uh, possible. Uh, in our world, there is enough food to feed everyone. It's just the ability to gather it and move it as necessary. And of course, as you all well know, uh, that obviously um, costs money. Um, so um, next slide, please. So as we talk about that, we want a hunger-free Tampa Bay by 2025, and we really want two outcomes, which is health and capability. Most critically, food provides health. So whether you're a child trying to learn in school, uh, whether you're a senior uh, trying to stay out of a doctor's office and live a good retired life, whether you're a family trying to make ends meet, we want health to be the outcome. The output's food, the outcome's health. We also want capability. Just as importantly, we're investing money and making sure that we can get people out of a food line. We often get asked the question, and it's a fair one, what are you doing to make sure that over the longer run, people have access to greater resources so they don't need a food bank forever? We're just as committed to that strategy as any other would be, because we want to do the same thing you want, which is to make sure that our friends and neighbors can live the lives they want to live. You'll see four different strategies down there. I won't go into those, but we have a strategy to fit our uh, objective as an organization. Next slide, please. I mentioned health and capability. Sorry, I previewed my slides. We can go on to the next one. So our key strategies here in Pasco County. So let's talk a little bit about the county first. Next slide. So when you look at Pasco County, there are about uh, today, as you all know, there's a little over 550,000 folks who are living in the county. Pre-COVID, at about a 14% food insecurity level, we had about 75 to 80,000 folks who every day were experiencing food insecurity. The post-COVID level, we're at about 18% food insecure, and that takes that number up close to 100,000 folks every day in Pasco County who are looking for some degree of food relief and or social services. Further, we would tell you that in our um, uh, look at the way the county is uh, built out, it's a higher percentage based on um, the Alice population. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But when we do the math on those 100,000 folks, that means there are about 18 million missing meals every year in Pasco County. So last year we provided about 5.5 million meals. This year we're looking to close to double that. 
9 million meals, and by 2025, we'd get to that fully realized number of 18 million. I think you all tend to know us mostly through our partners, uh, because if you think about the way that in which we work is we do some distribution ourselves, but a lot of our work is to make sure that our local partners in Pasco County have the resources they need. So great organizations like Volunteer uh, Way and Lester and his folks who have been partnered with for many, many years, uh, First UMC, United Methodist Church of Hudson, you, a lot of the folks that you know, uh, we make sure that they have the resources they need. Let me go on and dive a little deeper into food insecurity in uh, Pasco County. Next slide, please. When you look at this map, which is what we pay attention to, it goes on a gradation from left to right or light to dark as to where we have the greatest concentration of folks who are food insecure or within the ALICE population. If you don't know, ALICE stands for Asset Limited, Income Constrained, but Employed. If you wanted to take a rough number across the whole of Pasco County, about 42% of the residents of Pasco County earn enough money uh, to be over the uh, poverty threshold, but not enough money to keep their household stable. So going back to that 550,000 folks in the county, if you looked at an Alice population of some 42%, you would have close to 230,000 folks who economically are considered unstable. And what things like the pandemic do is they really rock the world of folks that were already teetering on the edge economically. If you go to the next slide, you'll see how we try and concentrate our services across those areas. So the red areas are where we are concentrating most of our relief efforts, either directly ourselves or with our partners. And we do that in a few different ways, but we want you all to know that we study population, we study population base, area of need, and try and make sure that we have resources built into those areas as effectively as we can. Next slide, please. So how do we do that? So one is we have school pantries um, that are opened that, uh, aside from food relief through the agencies, we have school pantries that we started building out several years ago that are allowing us to get to families in a different way. One of the things that we know is we have to be present where our community is. And so school pantries is where we started, but we've even moved into in Pinellas County, we're working with the bus system. We're working with medical offices, federal qualified health centers, all of those as we start to move into finding ways to put food where our uh, clients are, not necessarily where we are, but where they are. You'll note, our healthcare partnership with BayCare. We're working with two local hospitals as we build out a process by which we can uh, identify folks who are presenting with an illness, but probably have an underlying cause of food insecurity. Uh, and then we also, during the pandemic, built out a Meals to Go and Homebound delivery service uh, because we found that not everybody needed groceries, people also needed prepared meals. So we went from preparing about 500 meals a day to at our peak preparing 10,000 meals a day. We've settled at somewhere between two and 5,000 meals prepared every day based on what folks need. But this was particularly critical for seniors and other folks who don't always have the ability to manage a bag of groceries. Next slide, please. For you all, we did develop one of the additional methods that we developed in order to move more food into the communities. We launched a mega pantry in June uh, last year. Uh, we are grateful for your all support and partnership in that, and several of the commissioners have volunteered with us over time. Thank you for that, but we want to be accountable to what was given to us, uh, the financial support given to us, because it comes directly back to the county in terms of food. So we provided a little over 1.25 million meals uh, which affected about 30,000 plus folks in the community. We are still uh, providing that mega pantry and will continue to do so. Um, and then we also beefed up our drops in different places to make sure as you go back to that map that we were hitting the areas uh, where there were folks in greater concentration to make sure that we could answer uh, the pandemic's uh, call. Next slide, please. And then finally, as we start to move forward, as I mentioned before, we're going to continue to build out our partnerships in Pasco County. Traditionally, the church network has been a terrific partner to us and will remain so. But as I mentioned before, people are spending their time in different spots. And I, I uh, noted this a moment ago, 
but we, as I said, we launched a unique partnership in Pinellas County with the bus system, and we put actually pantries at different bus stations because we knew people were re using public transportation. We have had conversations in Hillsborough County about using the library system because that's where people go to get internet. Um, and we've mentioned uh, federal qualified health centers and other places where we know that our community is so that we can make sure that food is available to them. Um, I want to just skip down to a few of the bottom there. The Groceries on the Go is actually a mobile grocery store that allows us to put a grocery store in a place where there's not one uh, because we find that, again, access is a challenge. Uh, and then we're launching in uh, Pinellas County in early uh, July uh, the launch of an empowerment center, which is a centralized hub of service where we bring food in the form of a Trinity Cafe, which is a sit-down meal, a pantry where folks can get groceries, but we also then reach out to the partners in the community and we build a wraparound services model so that when someone walks in for a meal, they walk out with a future. They walk out with access to resources, capabilities, uh, and other things that might not be available to them um, uh, if it weren't for them coming in for a meal. I think as we would share with this uh, commission, when someone comes in for a meal, that's not all they need. Uh, and part of our objective is to make sure that when they come into our care, we provide them with resources and partnerships. We don't provide everything. We're, uh, that's not who we are, but we do connect folks with other partners, uh, mission partners, community partners, so that they know where to go to get the resources uh, that they need. And I'll finish my presentation today uh, with letting you all know that we are in the midst of the development of capital campaign here in Tampa. If we're going to get to a hunger-free uh, Tampa Bay by 2025, or in your instance, a hunger-free Pasco County, we'll need to change our facility and capabilities. We're in rented space that uh, we've long outgrown. So at some point, we'd like to talk to the commission a bit more about our work on that capital effort. And the reason why it matters is the greater our strength is, it will translate into more resources directly into Pasco County, not only meals, but programs, services, and other methodologies we can employ to get folks out of a food line. So with that, I hope I maintained my responsibility for timing, and I'll finish my presentation, uh, Mr. Chairman, and again, thank the commission for the opportunity to present to you all today. Yes, sir. <clears throat> thank you, you're right on time, and uh, you've done a great job, and I've actually been out there working on the line at, yes. uh, yes. there at the college, and I don't know if you're still at that site or if you're over at Burks Park, and. East Pasco. So. We've moved a couple. Yeah, we've moved a couple of times. Yes. Sir. Yeah. So, but y'all do very good work, and certainly appreciate everything you do in our county. So, thank Ms. you, Starkey. Yes, and I've had the pleasure of working with them when they did food distributions here on the west side, and also I went down to their facility and had a wonderful tour. It is, it's so impressive what they're doing at, um, and and their growth has been amazing. And I would really encourage the other commissioners to to go down and take that tour. Um, uh, they're going to be moving. I don't know when. Do you, you're, not, you're not moving anytime soon, are you? No, we have property identified, and we're finalizing that. And, of course, we have to raise the money to build yeah. a new facility. Yeah. But, uh, but thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, so, yeah, so really, really uh, very cool um, program. And, you know, they have companies that come in and work. When I was there, Jabel was uh, doing, I think, two shifts. And, uh, you know, it's something to think about that the county could go down and do a shift maybe one day. Um, but uh, certainly uh, as they uh, come, come uh, you know, they're going to be uh, building in Pinellas County, and then we hope they'll come up here to Pasco County and anything we can do to help. I've committed to help them uh, here in the county. Uh, just love their mission and, and what they do. So, Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, for that. Mr. It was Mariana. good to see you here. I say thank you for your great work. I know, um, especially volunteer way and, and the other groups that are on there, you're doing a great job supplying, so appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Very Lester's good. one of those heroes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all you do for our county. So certainly appreciate it. Yes, sir. Well, we appreciate the time to present to you today, and we thank you for your partnership and support, and we remain committed to making sure that, uh, that uh, our community is taken care of. We'll uh, hopefully see you all soon. Yes, sir. Mr. Moore, do you have something to say? I see you showing up. Well, I, I thank you. I'll, I'll wait till um, Mr. Mance gets off, and I was going to make a suggestion. But yeah, I'll, go ahead. It's on another item. He's he's done. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, I see that the time's starting um, for the Citizens Academy, but if I'm not correct, I think you guys are taking a picture with them. Um, let me go ahead and do R42. That's last before we do R41. Since you're running ahead a little bit. R41, that's what you're looking for? Yeah, I think he no, just R42, asked to do R42, R42 before R41. Yeah, we can do R42. You're going to go take pictures outside, I think. Okay. Thank you. R42. R42 requires you know a presentation. Well, you got to make a selection. <laughs> There's two well, reappointments in one selection. Okay. Yeah. So we have to do approval here. Okay. Good morning, Commissioner Denise Hernandez, oh. Planning and Development. R42 is PDD 210338, and this is for the reappointment of Jamie Girardi and Peter Hansel to the Planning Commission and for the Board of County Commissioners to select a Planning Commission member from the applicant list that was, um, there were 19 applicants um, that, you know, it was, it was uh, the application was put out for one month and we received 19 applicants, very qualified applicants. Uh, different things at uh, retired FDOT, civil engineers, community association managers, retired uh, Department of Justice employee, um, real estate investors, real estate appraisers, real estate brokers, mortgage brokers, um, folks that formerly served on planning and zoning commissions in other states, architects, uh, folks that served in the Public Works Commission in other states, Certified, there was one certified planner and a few contractors. So those are just to name a few of the different um, backgrounds that you received applications on. So um, again, the recommendation is to reappoint Jamie Girardi and Peter Hansel to the Planning Commission and to appoint a member from uh, to fill the vacancy um, that was uh, left behind by uh, Commissioner Cox, who resigned in um, February. Do we have a list? Mr. Moore? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moore? Thank you, sir. Can I uh, make a motion to, not re uh, to nominate um, Peter Hansel back on the Planning Commission? Are we, um, question? Can we, uh, can I amend your motion to nominate Peter Hansel and Jamie Girardi to the Commission? Well, I just thought we were doing them separate, so sorry. Well, they got them together. Yeah. Are you okay yeah, with that? Or? That's uh, recommendation. Okay. What was, what so was the, Commissioner Moore's motion? The motion is for Jamie Girardi and Peter Hansel to be appointed back on the Planning Commission. But what was Ms. Commissioner? My motion was Peter Hansel, and there was a He just was doing the one. Oh, okay. It's just taken both of them, the just staff's recommendations them, at like one time. On sheet, That's all. Just so. for time. Uh, and I, I like that motion, my Commissioner Starkey, to add uh, Jamie as well. So. Okay, so that's the second. Well, I don't want to step I up. I think he has to accept the motion. friendly. It's a friendly amendment she's asking for. Are you okay with that? Okay, that's fine. okay. That's fine. I, boy, we I can't really understand what he's saying. He said that's fine. Okay. Said that's All fine. right. Yeah. So let's okay. call we got it. You. Yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead and take the vote on those two. Uh, we've got a motion and a second. And I just want to confirm second was by Ms. Uh, Commissioner Mariano? Yes. Or well, it was oh, my, my, or, my second. Yeah. Amended second. Okay, amended, amended second. second. Yeah. Just making sure yeah. we got it down for the record. Thank you. Okay. District 2, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 1, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed unanimously. Okay. Ms. Now, Chairman. do we have a list? Yes, yeah. you have a list that was attached to your agenda, and I can go over the members with you if you'd like. Well, I can read them out, or the, I I would make a motion to um, accept Don Anderson's uh, a second. Okay. okay. For the discussion. Yeah. Discussion. Yes, um, and you know we've got some great applicants on there, Gosh, and yeah. Don Anderson would be a great yeah. one as well. But if you look at the way the structure is, the way we've changed it from seven every district commissioner and having one that's now wide open. I don't have anyone from District 5, and I will tell you, seeing Melissa Horn, who's a realtor in the area, very active in the area, I would love to see her get on. 
I, I have no idea where anybody lives that's on there. Um, I don't think we're going by that. I have, I have no idea where Don Anderson lives or... I only know where Peter Hansel lives because he's a friend of mine. <laughs> but um, I think we have a motion and a second on Don Anderson because I think he brings uh, a really fresh perspective that's needed um, to the commission. Uh, I do wonder, there's so many great applicants here and people that are wanting to serve. Is there something else we can do? Um, is there another com commission or council or something where we can put some of these talents to that's good a, use. That's a really great question because many of them, as they filled out their application, one of the questions is, are you willing to be considered for an alter con alternate committee? And most of them said yes. So Yeah, I think we should think about that. I think we should. So in the future, we yeah. can add people to a list that, you know, we, we always look for people that yeah. want to be involved. So And there's so many talents here that we should um, put to good use. I think, you know, when our citizens have... Uh, the ability to have more input in local government, it's a good thing. So maybe um, we talk about that and we okay. find a way to uh, let them have their voices heard so, and impacted. So I've got a motion and a second for John Anderson to be, Don, Don. Don, excuse me, Don Anderson to be approved for the plan commission. All those in favor by roll call vote. District two, Commissioner Moore. Aye. District three, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Nay. District 1, Chairman Oakley. Aye. Motion passed 4 1. Thank you. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. Mr. Chairman, yes, may I make a suggestion? Um, I think it would behoove us actually to have an alternate, if not two alternates, for the Planning Commission. That's a possibility because we do have instances where people, you know, life happens and people may have to resign. If we have an alternate, um, gives them the time to work with staff to understand the process, um, and if need be, fill in. Is that allowed on this committee to, or for planning commission to have alternates? Your ordinance is not set up for ordin for alternates. Oh, right. um, it's something that we could we could try and address. It's unusual on a on a board like that to have alternates only because. Well, they just can't automatically step yeah, on. Yeah, they, they can't step on automatically. Right. Um, but if that's the desire of the board, we can look and see whether we can work something out yeah. for that. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Yeah. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's just a thought. You know, it, again, it gives people time to learn the process, and they can jump right in if that, if that opening happens. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Um, Cox was um, appointed to a position which did not allow him to serve on the planning commission anymore. Um, and that uh, was you know, a great opportunity for him. He was able to take. Um, but if we have somebody kind of he's, he's work trained up, they can really step what right in. Yes, so if you would look into that through the attorney's office and uh, can we make come back to us with it. Can we make a motion to no. add? No. You gotta wait to hear back from the attorney's office. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, move on to um, R41, which is our uh, Citizens Academy. Good morning, Commissioners. Johanna Rodriguez, Intergovernmental Affairs. Uh, today, we'd like to celebrate the 2021 uh, graduating class of the Pasco County Citizens Academy. Uh, but first, we'd like to share a short video which highlights some of this year's sessions, as well as comments from a few participants. On behalf of County Administration, thank you to our Pasco County team, constitutional officers, and the 2021 Citizens Academy program participants for your efforts and enthusiasm in carrying out our program successfully during such challenging times. For 10 weeks, you learned the ins and outs of county government operations through the eyes of our dedicated team and got a behind the scenes look at what it takes to run our organization. 
Staying informed and understanding how local government works contributes to the success of our community. We appreciate your willingness to learn and provide feedback, and we look forward to continuing our mission of serving our community to create a better future. The thing that I liked best about the Citizens Academy was all the details um, that each department that uh, you know, presented their processes. Uh, the, de the details that they went into um, was very informative. I'm, I'm a detail-oriented person, and so um, I just learned everything about each department and each process that the Pasco County um, governs. I would definitely recommend the Citizens Academy uh, to others, and I say that because it is extremely important. A lot of times we're not aware of how government functions. This academy breaks it down in bite-sized pieces and gives you all the information, answers all of your questions, and, and leaves you with a much, uh, much more robust knowledge of how uh, Pasco County runs. You think you know because we have to do a lot of research as a realtor and provide intel to our to people moving here from out of state as well as just people moving here across the county. And I, I learned things. I had no idea we had a, a community commercial kitchen. I had no idea about the urban gardens. I had no idea what how much a fire truck costs. They're very expensive. And just all these little details are fascinating and I really know this sounds cheesy but I would drive home after the session and just feel really good about where we live and it, I know that sounds cheesy but I it's being around good people and it's just so it's such a beautiful feeling to feel, to know that you're in the hands the people who are in charge of running where you live they're good people that's what I, that's what I, that's my biggest takeaway. I'm very proud to live here. What I liked most about Citizens Academy was the opportunity to learn more about where our county is going, what the goals are. I was blown away with the data revealed to us and what the future entails, how we're going to hit a million in population in the not so far future. And that sounds scary as a resident, like, oh, how are we going to manage that? But after hearing the developers, I feel very confident that Pasco County really is the place to live and work. Congratulations to the Citizens Academy Class of 2021. For more information about Citizens Academy or to apply, visit mypasco.net slash Citizens Academy. Wonderful. So we'd like to present certificates of completion to the class. Uh, following the presentation during the noon break, uh, we asked board members to join us for a photo opportunity. Uh, so class, when I call your name, please come up for your certificate. Matthew Abbott. Derek Berger. Kathleen Fitzsimmons. John Grace. Michael Hamrock. Thank you very much. Adam James. Sherry Mercer. Joseph Micah. Andre Ragoza. Shannon Rains.
Adrian Rogers. Margot Scott. Teresa Schlimanoff. Leona Schuler. Deanna Richardson. Leanne Williams. Did I miss anyone? What's your name, sir? Joe. Joe. Let me get yours. Is your phone? Which one to get his? All right. Thank you. Congratulations. Good job. And where are we going to go more. outside now for the photo? Uh, when we break for lunch. We break for lunch in about 10 minutes. Okay, I got a lunch meeting, so let me tell them all. I just wanted to say congratulations to our 2021 class. We hope you enjoyed the program. We were able to graduate a total of 18 participants this time around. Uh, we look forward to our next cycle, which will commence in the fall of 2021. And um, we invite the board to take a, a photo with us outside uh, during the noon break. Thank you. As soon as we break, we'll come right out there. Okay, thank you. Okay. She gave it to me. Uh, R43 will be heard after uh, public hearing this afternoon. That's all for this morning. Now we go to old business. Mr. Moore. R43. Okay, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a few things, and I think there might be a couple pictures that uh, the team's going to put up. So on April 13th, uh, I partnered once again with Farm Share for a successful food distribution um, in the Wesley Chapel area of Pasco County. Uh, as you know, Farm Share is a great organization, and I really, really appreciate them bringing another truck full of fresh food to the community. Uh, this time, um, we had about 30 volunteers, gave out approximately 16,000 pounds of food in three hours. So I do want to you know that last time when I did Last year is a little over about 33,000 pounds of food, uh, less than three hours. Hopefully, it's a good sign that there's not as many people in need now, but obviously, there were quite a few people still in need because we did give out um, 16,000 pounds of food. So, thank you so much to the Pro Theater, um, Bistro and Entertainment for letting, letting us use their parking lot for the distribution. Um, and I also want to thank Senator Fasano, he showed up. Um, uh, Commissioner Fitzpatrick, she showed up to help out, as well as um, Judge sorry, I broke up, um, Joe Justice. And, and again, thank you to all the 30 volunteers. It was a great day, and thank you again, Farm Chair. We really, really appreciate all you did. Um, second thing I wanted to mention, you can throw up the next picture. Um, on April 15th, I had the honor of presenting uh, Mr. Joel Jackson of Lana Lakes with the 2020 Residential Waterwise Award for Paso County. That's partnership with the Tampa Bay Water and Extension Offices. And Mr. Jackson, just a kind, kind gentleman, um, and his wife as well, gave me a nice tour of the yard before the presentation. It's just full of plants and pollinators and, and, and native plants from here in Florida. You know, conserving water is so important these days, especially here in Paso County, being one of the fastest, and not the fastest growing counties in the state and the nation. So congratulations again, Mr. Joe. Jackson and his adult Jackson, as well as, well as his wife. Um, just again, just a great gentleman. Um, he's done so much. He worked for Hillsborough County and the city of Tampa for a number of years. He actually um, was the planner behind Lettuce Lake Park, if you've ever been there. And you'll, you know how, what a great asset that is. For me. Um, even though it's in Hillsborough County, great asset for the entire Tampa Bay region. And his last two things. Um, couple resolutions this morning. I want to thank you all for passing the two resolutions that I had on the consent agenda this morning. Uh, we recognize the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for winning the Super Bowl in Joe Bucks. 
Um, I'll be presenting that to them in the very, very near future um, at an event. And then we also passed the National Day of Prayer Resolution, which is May 6th this year. Um, I'll be presenting that um, during the National Day of Prayer on the east side of the county. And if I'm not correct, Commissioner Mariano, Mariano, I think you're doing that on the west side of the county, if I'm not correct, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Um, I had one more thing, but you know what? I'm going to wait until the next meeting because I'd like to be live um, and on, on the dais when we talk about that. So I am done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Starkey? Yeah. Um, I was going to show the pictures of the road damaged by the storm that I found, but I think you're going to bring that up in yours, so I will just say um, we did find those pictures that we talked about before. Um, I do. Uh, I was on a tour on the east side of the county with the county and um, with Mr. Carballo and others looking at some of the road conditions of some of our new roads. And I came upon this um, development. I'm not going to say, I have no idea who built it. Um, and I'm not going to say where it is, but I'm going to say we have <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. And um, is this a photo or a video? Oh, take a look at these townhomes. And um, as you see, there is not one tree, except that one, the one little palm tree over there. It's concrete, no side, no street trees, nothing. I have some photos too. I don't know if they, they made it there. It's kind of similar to the video, but um, we had this problem with, at the reserve over in Sun Coast, by the Sun Coast, and um, was that a city project? No, no, no. This is in the county. Uh, we were able, uh, Mr. Biles went in there, and I think he, um, well, we now have palm trees in front of those townhomes, but in talking to Brad Tippin, um, this is what our ordinance allows. And um, our ordinance requires a certain amount of trees per the size of the lot, but they're putting them in the little backyards, and I guarantee you those trees are going to be cut down, and we have nobody who goes out to see if people are keeping the house, the trees that are required on their lots to stay. So um, can you put that, just put the video back up, even if it's not running or, or run it again? I can't think of any place where I've ever been where they allow this to happen, um, you know, in the, just to have n no landscaping and no, no shrubbery or anything. I mean, you, you could already see cars were parking o on, on, on some of the other photos. They're parking over these little teeny landscape triangle things. They're not going to live. So that was really disappointing. So I, I really want us to fix that in our land development code. Um, Ms. Chairman? Yes, sir. Just can I, can I tag on with you on that? Yeah. Because, I mean, looking at that, I saw something like this up in Orlando uh, when my daughters were up there and they were renting up there, and it was like, Parking was ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to, if you look at the, like the, even the truck that's in there, it hangs over the sidewalk. We need to make sure we set these things up. They have enough parking as well on their own premises yeah. as opposed to having to travel down and around, et cetera. So I think it's something we should take a look at immediately as well. Yeah. Right. You know that some of these, uh, if, they're, they're, if they're three bedroom, they're going to have three cars, four cars. Yep. And uh, all you, it's, it is not going to be. It's gonna. It reminds me of some of the things I saw in some not nice neighborhoods in Philadelphia once a long time ago. So that we're allowing this in what is supposed to be a premier county is a real flaw to me in our land development code. Um, so uh, I'm very pleased to say that Amskills closed on the uh, purchase of their 13,000 square foot um, building, and uh, we've been uh, we have been visited by Congressman Bill Arrakis. He he has included us in one of his uh, top 10, um, uh, what do you call it, earmarks that he's allowed to submit. So we're very excited of his support for manufacturing training and whatever else, whatever other kind of training will come uh, from that site. Um, yesterday, Will Weatherford was there. Um, and he was, you know, speaker when we were able to get this program off the ground. And he's going to be helping us as well. And we're just very excited of what, what this means for um, the holiday community, the county at large, and um, and really Florida, you know, to, to bring back manufacturing, I think, is so, so important. Um, and uh, at Tampa Bay Water, as uh, mm -hmm. Commissioner Oakley and I both sit on, we are in the midst of uh, working for a search 
company to uh, help us recruit a new head of Tampa Bay Water. Sure. And at T. Barda, we, are, um, we have a very important meeting coming up where we will be, I think, voting on hopefully a, a kind of a modified uh, rapid bus program that we think we can get Hillsborough on board with. It's just been um, a real challenge for Hillsborough to be thinking about the region at large and not just at their own county. So, um, but we, we hope that this one will make it through. When they, when they did the numbers, I should send this to you, they showed that some, something like 70% of the people who are going to use this route are Hillsborough County <laughs> residents. So, you know, that they're not on board was just, you know, it's frustrating. But uh, that's my update for today. Okay. Christina, do you Oh, wait, I'm sorry, I have one more thing. Oh. Very important. Can you show the pictures of the storm damage? So we had a storm come through last week um, in Gulf Harbors, and um, we thought it was a tornado. Um, and it just came upon us in one of those red lines. Um, but it turned out to be a whole series of microbursts. And I, and I want to share with, that's a county truck that diverted from Mo the Moon Lake cleanup to come pick up this, the porch of a, of a house that I'm not sure that was a legal porch. Um, and it, the, the, that screen porch happened to have insulation and a roof on it, so that was interesting. But um, we had vinyl fence, vinyl fences blown out of the ground, pool cages destroyed, uh, another pool cage destroyed, screen room, a pool, uh, pool gauge torn off a house on um, Galleon Court on my street, a roof was damaged. Uh, we had trees damaged, uh, flat roofs bit torn off the back of homes and uh, many sheds were blown off their foundations and tree and a lot more tree and roof damages of, and the addresses I don't know. So um, we have at least six addresses and then many others whose addresses we have not collected yet. On my street, someone's property blew off from a couple blocks away and landed on the back of that Galleon courthouse, did a lot of damage. It's a no-name storm. They cannot, the, the homeowner cannot file for insurance. What's really frustrating, and this is why we're concerned about the boat covers, because no one, no one, you would not have had time to run out there in the storm and take, take your, your stuff off. The, the, the house that was on my street that was damaged, that homeowner has to pay for it themselves. The, not the house whose porch flew into their porch and roof, but the homeowner who was affected. And they have a $2,500 deductible, so they're out $2,500 plus the repairs. And I can tell you that every day there's been a truck on that street um, helping them. They came immediately after the storm. I didn't walk back there to see what happened, but um, yesterday there were two or three trucks for, um, two or three big trucks parked there. So. Uh, this is the problem when you have fl debris that's flying, you don't have responsibility for the damage if it's your debris. So, did you, you showed the yeah. pictures, right? Yeah. That was one house, you there were seven. You item that you wanted to address before I was before. Asked. Yes, please. You got one item total, or you got more than one item? I have you? multiple yeah. items, but I would like okay, to address well, one item. One that you want her yeah, because I, I have to go to a meeting. And after that, then we'll recess. Yeah. Make it quick. Can, <laughs> as quickly as I can. Can I have the storm, Pasco storm damage on the screen, please? So I know not everyone was here when everything had happened with the storm damage roads, and I just want to give everyone a brief history over it. Um, in December of 2015, it was a program was set up to identify the initial roads and I wanted to do the presentation first, but just so we don't have too much time. At that time, I know Commissioner um, Mariano moved to approve $3.5 million from the P BP settlement funds. Commissioner Wells and Commissioner Moore seconded. The motion was to clarify and indicate the BP funds were to front the work and would be repaid. Um, Commissioner Starkey called on the motion, and it was a unanimous vote, five to zero. This one. It's the one with the brief overview from July 28th to 2016. 
when staff presented it to the board? Maybe we should revisit this after Can't. when we have time to discuss it. It was sent to me by Dan Biles, Jim, Mr. Biles. Yeah. Well, no, that's good. Yeah, we can talk about it more. I can present it before we go into the public hearing. And have to vote. Don't on. normally take that. You can. Oh, I see why you want to do it now. Well, you can hmm. do it during the public hearing yeah. for Crane's okay. Roost if you yeah. wish. Okay. Yeah, you I mean, I don't see any problem that with that item, as part of the presentation. Okay, thank you. It's relevant to the time. It's relevant Okay, so we'll, um, we'll recess now. Everybody will go out for pictures now and then recess and be back here at, at 1.30 for public hearings. <laughs>